Well, good morning and welcome to the 20th anniversary of our legal laneway breakfast. I'm Greg Gard, Chair of the Victoria Law Foundation, and it's simply wonderful to have so many of you joining us either online or in person, and I extend a very warm welcome to you all. This event was designed to enable legal professionals to come together in a convivial way to mark the beginning of the legal year, and we'll take a look at how working in the law has changed. Lynn and I are delighted to be joined today by four special guests. Attorney General Jacqueline Symes MP, Fiona McClay, Victorian Legal Services Board CEO and Commissioner, and my colleague, Justice Jacinta Forbes of the Supreme Court of Victoria. We'll also be joined by Jacob Varkese, CEO of Morris Blackburn Lawyers. And we look forward to hearing from them of their insights. And I do want to acknowledge with a record attendance of judges, my colleagues, Justices, Kristen Walker of the Court of Appeal, Andrea Salamandris and Michelle Quigley of the, of the Supreme Court. And Michelle is, of course, the President of VCAT, together with Chief Judge Peter Kidd of the County Court, Judges Kate Hawkins, Peter Loritson, Anna Robertson, Ted Woodward and Mayan Tran, and Magistrates Donna Bacos and Vince Caltabiano. I also welcome Tony North KC, Chair of the Victorian Law Reform Commissioner, Deborah Glass, our State Ombudsman, Fiona Bennett, Chair of the Victorian Legal Services Board, Roe Allen, Commissioner of the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, and Tanya Wolfe, President of the Law Institute of Victoria, now in her third year. We also have 12 CEOs or directors of organisations and community centres, too many I'm afraid to read them all out to you, who are present and who are great supporters of the Foundation. Uh, we now have a special treat, not done before, a vocal acknowledgement of country. And it's now my very great pleasure to welcome to the stage Wiradjuri woman Shantai Cherie to perform a vocal acknowledgement of country. Shantai has featured as a principal artist with Short Black Opera, studied in New York and has performed with the Victorian Opera, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and Black Swan Theatre, to name just a few. I would like to thank Victorian women lawyers and the Victorian Bar for co-sponsoring Shantai's performance this morning. Will you all please join me in welcoming Shantai?
Well, thank you, Sean Ty. That was just fantastic. Uh, it's always a privilege to have the Attorney General with us for this event. So uh, let me again uh, introduce Jacqueline Symes, MP. As you will all be aware, Jacqueline is now in her third year as Attorney General. She was reappointed to the role after the 2022 election. She is also the Minister for Emergency Services. She began her career in government as an advisor to the then Deputy Premier and Attorney General, Rob Hulls, who we all know. In 2014, she was elected to Parliament as an Upper House member for Northern Victoria, an electorate that covers a large <laughs> swathe of the state from the South Australian border to past Albury and takes in Bendigo, Macedon and the Yan Yeen. Well, welcome, Attorney. We look forward to hearing your remarks to open our legal year. Well, good morning, everyone. And of course, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and paying my deep personal respects to elders past, present and emerging. And um, Sean Tay, that took my breath away. That was um, beautiful. Thank you so much for such a unique and gorgeous welcome to country. I extend those respects to any elders who may be present with us today. Thank you, Justice Gard, for your warm welcome, um, as always, um, and for your acknowledgement of the many amazing people that are here today, some that I appointed. So um, good to see you, good to see you here. Um, but many of you I have either met in person or indeed online, and you have been a fantastic asset to me as the Attorney General of this great state. And of course, I am absolutely delighted to be returned uh, to office and have in my sights four years with big plans. Um, I do want to um, acknowledge that I, I accept um, the great privilege and honour and recognise the important role that I have to continue in this role. It gives me the courage of the government's law reform agenda, improving the justice system to ensure that it is fair, fit for purpose and accessible. I'd also, of course, like to mention it's just so wonderful to be here in person after two years of this wonderful event being held online. Um, it feels particularly special to be actually physically in Hardware Lane rather than it being just our virtual background. Um, and while for many of us last year marked a return to some form of normality or something that was life reminiscent of before the pandemic, for others it was much different and anything than familiar. At the end of last year, you'd be well aware that many Victorian communities suffered the worst flooding event that they had experienced in more than 150 years. And the enormous task of, re of recovery continues today and will for many years to come. As you know, during times of great public need like pandemics, flooding, fire, the legal sector plays a crucial role in providing services to those impacted. I'm the only Attorney General in the country that also has the portfolio of emergency services, but in many respects they are just so complementary. At their heart they are fundamentally about people and what people need. I've seen firsthand just how vital it is to ensure that individuals, small businesses and farmers grappling with their legal problems get the assistance and advice they need. It just takes some of that pressure off. Um, a traumatic situation. It enables them to focus on their recovery and the recovery of their community when they get that dedicated help, which is sometimes just so difficult to navigate on your own. On that note, I would certainly like to take the opportunity to thank the Federation of Community Legal Centres and their members, Justice Connect, the LIV, the Vic Bar and VLA, who together coordinate disaster legal help. It connects people from impacted communities with these important dedicated legal services. I'd like to just touch on my main priority for this year, and that's making the justice system one that upholds the rights of all Victorians and protects our most vulnerable. I'm of course very proud of the reforms that my team have implemented over the last two years, but we're not wasting the opportunity of having four more. We want to make further progress and work towards what's more than just a tagline for this event, but something we should all strive for a fairer, fit for purpose and more accessible justice system. 
As a government and as the attorney, we will continue to listen and engage with stakeholders, especially on measures that address the root causes of offending and reduce recidivism, with a particular focus on the disadvantaged and most vulnerable, who we all know are overrepresented in our criminal justice system. Our aspiration is to rethink how our laws and systems approach offending behaviour. We know we can particularly do better when it comes to young people. Of course, our aim should be to prevent youth from entering our justice system in the first place. And let's face it, it's actually not rocket science. Greater supports and diversions, these are programs that are already working to keep many people out of the justice system. But there is much more to be done to build on what works and put our collective efforts to ensuring that this is a reality for all young people. Ongoing work around raising the age of criminal responsibility is just one part of this. Our bail laws, we want them to protect the community, but we want them to not have a disproportionate or unintended impact on those accused of low-level offending who frankly do not present a risk to the community or their safety. I have foreshadowed changes to bail laws and that work is continuing as a matter of urgency. And I'd like to thank the many of you, many of you are here, who have talked to me about your experiences and views on this important reform. I welcome constructive community conversation on this and I've been, um, I've been pleased to see how constructive it has been to date. We also have in principle agreement for bipartisan support for this important reform in the parliament. Separately, I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the coroner's finding in the Veronica Nelson inquiry. The death was a tragedy, nothing less. Ms Nelson's family, her friends and her community occupy my thoughts as I advance these important changes. Another topic that I spend a lot of time discussing with stakeholders and frankly most women I know, including the more than 50% of our cabinet, is that a different approach is needed to make our justice system fit for purpose in its response to sexual violence. Last year, we took the step to adopt a more victim-centred approach enshrining affirming consent laws as laws in Victoria. We have not been shy in setting a standard of consent that meets the community expectations, but more importantly, in the context of sexual assault proceedings in court, shifting the focus away from the scrutiny of the actions of the victim survivor to those of the accused. We've made further improvements in jury directions and court procedures to minimise the trauma and harm to victim survivors in prosecuting these matters. I'll continue to build on our strategy and look for further improvements that make the system fairer, such as how criminal investigations and trials can minimise trauma, how the system can better support victim survivors and keep them informed and how education and outreach can shift community attitude about sexual offending and consent. Women's safety can also be improved through, through legislative reforms to stalking offences, non-fatal strangulations and continued effort in reducing family violence. We know that to deliver lasting change, system-wide reform is critical, but the opportunity for cultural changes starts with us. So I'll take the opportunity to mention the Women's Legal Service because they're looking at this very issue for our sector. Their project, Starts With Us, is something that is key to some of the work they're doing. Through this project, the Women's Legal Service is looking to the legal and justice workforce in Victoria to contribute to the primary prevention of violence against women by responding to the gender drivers of sexism and inequality against women as they manifest in the legal and justice systems. The government, of course, wants to do more to contribute to this cultural change, which is why we have required that firms on the government legal services panel, that's firms that we engage to do our legal work, that 50% of barrister briefs and council fees must be to female barristers. We're also going further and asking firms uh, on the panel to turn their mind to gender equality by mandatory reporting of gender pay gaps to government. And importantly, we're encouraging law firms to engage with the community legal sector through new changes to our pro bono requirements, including the requirement to provide legal secondees to assist CLC staffing. We see this as a win-win for law firms, for CLCs, for lawyers and their clients, and I really look forward to realising these benefits. 
Lawyers, of course, contribute to our state in so many ways, in so many diverse ways. I hope I've touched on some of the topics that are important to you. But if I haven't, I can guarantee you I am looking at something that is of interest to you. And you're always welcome to contact me to put forward some of your views. I do want to take the opportunity to thank the legal sector for your dedication, your professionalism and hard work. As I have noted, many of you have contributed to the government's reform agenda. As AG, I certainly welcome your contribution and I look forward to meeting more and more of you, particularly in person. There's such amazing work going on. I'm always blown away by the commitment of the legal sector, particularly in their work with vulnerable, vulnerable clients. So it's really important for me, for legislation and policy development, that I can continue to hear about your experiences to inform the discussions that I'm having on a daily basis. I hope that you've all returned from the New Year break, if you had one, um, well rested and recharged. I'm absolutely pumped and looking forward to a really productive year, which for me has already started, but um, we do step up the gear a little bit because Parliament's about to start this morning, so the first sitting week for the 23. Um, I know there's lots to do this year. I know you guys are looking forward to a positive year. I look forward to hearing more about it. And thank you so much for welcoming me back to your laneway breakfast for the start of the legal year. Thank you ever so much, Attorney General. It's, um, it's a total pleasure to, uh, to have you back in person out of the, the wardrobe. Some of you may recall that uh, the attorney joined us from her cupboard uh, <laughs> last year and the year before. So it's a, it's a delight to have you in person. As Justice Guard mentioned, this is the 20th anniversary of this event. And I hope that you've had a chance to see some of the comments from people who were here at the beginning 20 years ago or who have made it a sort of standing item on their calendar. I would like to acknowledge my predecessor in the role as Executive Director at the Victoria Law Foundation, Cathy Laster, who came up with this idea for an informal and an accessible event. Cathy, your legacy lives on. Well, in keeping with the origin story of the Legal Laneway Breakfast, or the LLB as we call it, to some people's confusion, as you can imagine, <laughs> we'll hear soon from a couple of people who have combined their legal careers with a very strong commitment to family. Before that, however, let me introduce you to another of our regular guests. Delighted to welcome back Fiona McClay, Victorian Legal Services Board CEO and Commissioner. Fiona was appointed to that role in January 2018 and has just been reappointed, congratulations Fiona, for a second five-year term. And prior to her appointment, she was the CEO of Justice Connect, also dear friends of, of the foundation, as you're all aware, a leading not-for-profit that provides a critical nexus between people needing legal assistance and the pro bono skills that the, the attorney was alluding to in terms of their massive commitment of the legal profession. Fiona has also been General Counsel at World Vision Australia and Special Counsel at Clayton Utes, so an extraordinarily broad experience and it's great to have you back, Fiona. Thanks, Lynn, and great to see you all uh, as we gather here on Wurundjeri country in central Nam. I want to pay my respects to uh, elders past and present and acknowledge uh, that we are on Aboriginal land Yes, yeah, such a delight to be in this wonderful laneway. If you look up such fantastic buildings, you get such a sense of, of history and uh, imagining the people that must have been walking through this laneway for the last 120 plus years, maybe more than that, 150 maybe. And then obviously, um, before it was hardware lane, it would have been uh, land that the Wurundjeri walked. So um, it's fitting, I think, to think about the history as we're here on the 20th birthday of the legal laneway breakfast. Um, and as um, Lynn mentioned, it does coincide with my reappointment. Thank you, Attorney. I'm one of the people you've, you've appointed. So <laughs> delighted to have the very great privilege of uh, being the regulator of the profession in Victoria and also the custodian of the Public Purpose Fund, which I know uh, many of you know about. There is a lot of energy, I think, isn't there, gathering together like this for the first time uh, out of bedrooms uh, and cupboards and uh, wherever else we all spent the last couple of years. I can remember the early days of the breakfast. I'm not going to own up to have, having been at the first one, um, but let's just say I've been coming for a while now. Um, 
And I think as we look back, it's really remarkable to see the impact of a relatively small gesture, really, to gather people together at the start of a legal year uh, in a way that would enable more women to attend. Uh, and think about how much has changed since that time. We produce an annual report every year, and mainly it's read by myself and my board. Uh, but this year, uh, in January, the uh, online Oz Daily picked up that uh, we had reported that 75% of new lawyers in Victoria were women. And we were on Instagram and TikTok, astonishingly enough, uh, with comments and references to Legally Blonde, which probably um, references the age of the person who wrote the article on, on the online daily, but anyway, uh, and better call, better call Saul, which is a bit more modern. So this was a headline-grabbing figure, uh, and it was applauded as an inevitability. And maybe, maybe that's how some people see it, but I think really it belies uh, decades' worth of small and hard work, hard-won gains that have led to this really profound democratic shift. So we see over the, the last couple of decades the significant increase of representation of women in key leadership roles. And if I may say so, we see that this morning with Tanya Wolfe is here, the attorney, myself. Um, that's a big change. Improvements to workplace culture, stuttering as they sometimes feel like they are, have definitely happened in that time. And the commitment to tackling sexual harassment in the workplace uh, has, has changed dramatically in a relatively short time, which is a terrific thing. Uh, increase of paid parental leave, and then most recently, uh, the embrace of remote and flexible working. Uh, thank you, COVID. There's a sentence you'd never think anyone would say, but that has certainly helped, uh, I think, in showing that it is possible to work flexibly um, and in ways that can accommodate people's, people's lives in a more meaningful way. Uh, I do want to also acknowledge the, the work of the Victorian Government with the requirement for panel firms to, um, to have more than 50% uh, women who are uh, doing government work and then the, the reporting on diversity and the gender pay gap I think is really, really important. So thank you for that. And the final thing, of course, is just the hard work of hundreds and thousands of men and women in the profession who said, no, we want this profession to look different and be better for, for women and also people um, from all different backgrounds. Of course, there, with any shift, there's challenges and we're getting really good at attracting new people into the profession and those numbers have not dropped off over the last few years. We continue to see uh, new lawyers coming into the profession every year, which is really pleasing, but we want to retain them as well. And I think we all need to work together to ensure that everyone in the profession gets a fair shot at a long, successful, uh, and most importantly, safe and fulfilling career. So women are still underrepresented in senior roles, particularly at partnership level um, in larger firms. And it bears repeating that burnout doesn't benefit anyone and is still too common. It's bad for lawyers, it's bad for their clients, it's bad for their practice and the profession as a whole. So I think in 2023, we need to again focus on the importance of well-being, and we'll be doing that in my office. We need to keep pushing for cultural change that promotes healthier workplaces. And this needs to happen across the whole sector, not just individual workplaces. Every workplace, from law firm to barristers chambers, from government department or agency, from court and even perhaps parliament itself, needs to own the part it plays in helping to ensure workplaces are healthy and productive. This is also why sexual harassment will remain firmly in our sights as the regulator of the profession. And I know we share this priority with many lawyers, law practices and organisations here today, and you can count on our continued support. I mentioned the Public Purpose Fund before. It's a key part of the work of the Legal Services Board through which we fund legal and justice organisations in Victoria. We've got access to justice as a third of our three strategic objectives in our corporate plan. It's really important to us. We're a very proud funding partner of Women in Mentoring. Um, great to see them uh, here today as um, the organisation that we're supporting. Our support for programs like Women in Mentoring is a really important part of our Access to Justice goal, and we're going to continue this work uh, in 2023. We provide support to Victoria Legal Aid, the Law Foundation, and the Law Reform Commission as well, and this support provides really tangible benefits for people in the community. Also this year, we're beginning a specific program of work to ensure that our services are culturally safe and our people are culturally competent to work with First Nations people. And we're commencing cultural awareness training, in fact, this week for our staff. 
We were really proud to take the important step last year of including an acknowledgement of country on all practising certificates uh, in Victoria. And we're really looking forward on building, to building on this work uh, and have engaged a First Nations advisor to help us do that. We want to listen closely to the stories of First Nations people and their experience with the legal system as part of that work. So that's enough from me. Thanks again to, to Lynn and Justice Guard for inviting me to speak today. Congratulations on 20 years of the LLB. Um, and I was really pleased to hear you're going to Ballarat tomorrow to do another one up there, which is really fantastic. What a great way to start the year and celebrate um, this important event. Thanks, everyone. Thank you ever so much, Fiona. As, as she mentioned, yes, we have the first regional legal laneway breakfast in Ballarat tomorrow morning in another laneway. <laughs> Professions like ours, as Fiona has alluded, can be demanding and relentless. And over the last 20 years since the, the establishment of this event, we have seen some significant change. And as Fiona mentioned, the, those efforts continue to try and put work back into balance with our other obligations as humans, as parents and carers and volunteers and participants in so many other aspects of life. As she also mentioned, a profession which reflects the diversity of our community and the reality of our lives is good for us and it's good for Victorians. So in keeping with the origins of the Legal Laneway Breakfast, we have asked two prominent people in the law to briefly share their experience and to reflect on how far we've come over the last 20 years. If I could ask them to join me on the stage, the Honourable Justice Jacinta Forbes and Jacob Varghese, CEO of Morris Blackburn. First, let me just give a brief, not that you need it really, uh, outline of, of the legal background and then we'll get into the other more interesting stuff. Justice Forbes was appointed in April 2019 and officially welcomed as a judge of the Supreme Court of Victoria in May that year. After a varied practice as a solicitor, Justice Forbes joined the Victorian Bar in 2000 and was appointed QC in 2014. Her Honour has extensive experience, as many of you would know, and specialisation in professional negligence, personal injury, product liability and general common law matters. Jacob Varghese is currently Chief Executive of Morris Blackburn. He's been at the helm through some pretty tumultuous times, a period of very intense change, both to the firm and the world, and certainly for the law. Jacob led that team through Australia's largest food safety class action settlement and oversees the firm's social justice practice. So welcome to you both and thank you so much for being part of this particularly interesting, I think, exploration of, of life in the law in 2023. We've asked you to think about uh, work and life in a couple of ways, and I hate that division, but anyway, here we are, work-life balance, it seems to me utterly inadequate to the task. But I am keen to hear your thoughts on, on, on your experience there. But before we do that, a quick sketch of your circumstances so that people understand you, the experience you bring to this conversation. Judge, what is your family situation? If I may, uh, be, may be so bold. Chaotic is probably a good <laughs> description, but in practical terms, uh, my husband and I had our first child when I was a solicitor in private practice. I then went to the bar and had three more children who are now just all finished school. Um, so we're in a household of young adults, which has its own challenges. And um, I was appointed, as you said, in 2019, at which time I was a parent of teenagers. Um, so they're, they're my That's fun. Okay, I think anyone who has had that experience can relate, and even those of you who haven't can picture. Jacob, tell me about your uh, household. My family circumstances are a lot better on holidays than they are during the, the school term. Uh, I have three school-aged daughters, they aged 15 down to seven, uh, and my wife is also full-time working. So uh, the last couple of weeks we've been adjusting back to, to what that means in reality. Here we go, 2023 is underway. Well, let's talk about your experiences in managing caring and, and professional responsibilities and trying to, to maintain some level of balance, whatever that looks like. Jacob, what is the hardest part, do you think, in, in managing the working, caring double act? I think the hardest part is having a clear sense 
of what solutions are going to work. Inevitably, whatever solution works for your family will probably not be working in six months. So a constant conversation with your partner, but also really importantly, a constant conversation with your employer uh, about what your needs are and how those are changing over time. Uh, I don't know any uh, leader of a law firm in Victoria who isn't acutely aware that you can't maintain and keep retain and keep talented employees if you're not meeting their work-life balance needs. Uh, and so a lot really then comes back to employees to be clear about what they want uh, and confident to say so. Uh, in most cases, you're not going to get your head bitten off when you ask, because I do know that leaders of law firms are very, very concerned to get this right. Uh, so the, 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 big, the most difficult thing sometimes is finding that, that uh, courage that it's not going to be career limiting uh, and uh, it, it's worth uh, asking for, for help. Uh, that was my experience, certainly. Lots to unpack there, but sadly we don't have time this morning. Judge, if you were to cast back 20 years and uh, offer advice to your younger self in terms of this, this particular um, phase of, of crazy life, how would you suggest she navigate it? I think 20 or so years ago when I started a family, my priority and the public debate around um, childcare and having children as a working parent was about the first year of life. It was a sit time when there was no entitlement to paid maternity leave. There was very little job security about what you might come back to after a period of leave, whether it was paid or unpaid. So my priorities then aligned with the, the public debate. Um, and I think we've come a long way since then, and I've come a long way as well in my learnings. And what I've learned is that um, it is not a one-year process. It's a 20-plus year process. And although now I think the, the time in the first year is quite structured, it's often unstructured beyond that. And um, we talk about that long process as a juggle. And I want to challenge that idea because I think a juggle is something that is completely unsustainable over the long period of time. A juggle to me, um, and don't get me wrong, it is a juggle at times because there are times when there are immovable and competing obligations, but a juggle it supposes that one puts family and caring responsibilities into one ball and throw it up in the air, and your work obligations into another ball and you throw that up into the air and you hope they never collide. But in fact, what we need to do is look at those obligations that we have to family, whether it's children or siblings or, as I'm learning at this end of my career, aged parents um, or obligations that arise out of natural disasters like the floods that the attorney mentioned. Um, those obligations have to coexist um, with our employment obligations. Uh, we, we shouldn't be considering them as separate spheres. And that's really the, the thing that I've learned and the advice that I'd give to anybody starting out as I did. Picture it differently, frame it, frame it differently. I'd like to take a minute now to, to move forward and to cast forward perhaps 20 years or so. Uh, we have come a long way and I think your comments, uh, Judge, around you know, the way we think about children and commitment uh, resonate deeply with me as well. But what needs to happen from here? Jacob, what would you nominate as a critical change that we need to make? So I think there are, there are two things I'd nominate. The first is the... For a long time, we've considered work-life balance to be mother's problems. And the easiest way to halve the extent to which it's mother's problems is to make sure it's father's problems too. And I think there's been a lot of change in the last decade about that, and I think there's a lot more room to make sure that, uh, that we're providing, as employers, uh, we're providing the same amount of flexibility to men so that they can stand up and, and help as well. Uh, and similarly, what I was talking about before, uh, men need to find the, the courage to, uh, to ask their bosses for the kind of flexibility that they're going to need. And I think the second thing that troubles me a bit is 
while law firms, I think, have got this uh, pretty well understood, there's obviously a lot more work to be done, obvi- but, but I think they understand the problem. I sometimes worry, and I'd be interested in um, Justice Forbes' view on this, is that sometimes the courts uh, and barristers continue to impose unrealistic deadlines or expectations um, that make it harder for solicitors to, to, ma- to balance work and life. And so I think that would be something I'd like to see over the next 20 years is, is, um, is judges in particular having more sensitivity to the consequences of really unrealistic deadlines. I'm always encouraged to find judges who started off as solicitors because I think that uh, um, sometimes that, that experience of having worked in teams and collaborating and having empathy is really useful on the bench. Okay, there's, a, there's a, an interesting <laughs> response, I think. The ball is in your court, Judge. Right. What, well, what do you take from that and, and, and then perhaps pick up on what you think your priorities should be from now? All right. I might do it the other way around. Okay. Um, I might start with saying I agree that I think that the way forward is to stop thinking about caring obligations as an issue for women. It's an issue that faces everybody who is a, um, a member of a family or a community um, who takes on obligations beyond Um, their employment. And that should be encouraged. I think it it makes us better as a community that we take those on. So I think the conversation stops being about um, women and about being a problem. It's not a problem. It's something that we should embrace and encourage. Um, I think COVID has um, given us some insights that are good, but it's also exposed some dangers. I think that... um, we now understand quite easily that working from home can be a norm, that we've lost the suspicion about whether people are really working if they're not at home um, or if they're not in a workplace. Um, It shows that without commutes and without travel and with having a virtual base in our own space, um, we can work efficiently and we can have more time for family. Um, At least in theory, that's, that's the thing. But it's also blurred the lines between the personal and um, the, the work environment. There's an expectation of family that, you, that because you're present in the home, you're available to them all the time. And there's an expectation driven by technology that wherever you are, email and Zoom and mobile phones can reach you and expect you to answer. And so I think we need to manage some of those things that COVID have thrown up. The other thing I think that informs the discussion that we have as an industry is that we better mark the lines that differentiate where those obligations intersect because that marks the expectations that everybody has. And we don't want to be having conversations at the point at which people have found that obligations are colliding. We want to have those those discussions at the point at which everybody is managing expectations. And to take up Jacob's point, it is important that we have an industry-wide discussion about that. And that discussion is happening. There there are discussions, certainly between the Supreme Court and the Bar and the Law Institute um, and the various other solicitor bodies about how to better manage those expectations. One of the difficulties, I think, is that Um, the choices that people make about how to balance their obligations are not universal. People have different choices and trying to manage that variety is difficult. Um, From the court's perspective, we're managing the administration of justice for clients who want their disputes determined in a timely fashion and in an orderly way. And for some people, the time within which to do that is extremely limited. So there are a number of of things that are to be considered when we look at how to manage expectations. But the most important thing about the discussions that we have, I think, is that we recognise that discussions about health and wellbeing, discussions about caring obligations, are not discussions where somebody, an individual, is asking for an indulgence. They're a discussion about uh, a right and an obligation to provide a a safe and healthy and balanced work environment. And that's something that we all should take on board. Beautifully put. Thank you very, very much to both of you.
Jacinta Forbes, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, and Jacob Varghese of Morris Blackburn. An enormous pleasure to have you both. And I think we've kicked off the next round of conversations around how we manage the interplay between our home lives and our work obligations. So thank you again for being part of that. Thanks, Liam. Well, sometimes we all need some support, and that's especially the case when you find yourself involved with the criminal justice system, as so many of you can relate. Criminalised women often have very significant challenges, and having a mentor, someone in your corner, can make a massive difference to the outcome of a legal process. And that's why, as Fiona McClay mentioned, we have chosen WAM, or Women and Mentoring, as our fundraising partner this year. And if you haven't already, can I absolutely encourage you to go online, press the button to donate, and make a, a small commitment to a much more accessible and appropriate and supportive justice system in Victoria. They are an amazing organisation making a very big difference, and we will send the link out today to all of you via email, but as I say, it's on the website as well, so please take up that opportunity. And now for my quick plug. Here's the moment I get a captive audience to tell you about what the Law Foundation has been doing for the last few months and what's, uh, what's on the agenda for 23. As many of you would know, we've had an extremely productive 12 months, COVID schmovid, I say, with a number of very influential research reports. We've looked at what data is held across the sector and how it's used, a workforce profile of the community legal sector, and some great work that's still un underway on how costs are determined, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. We staged an outstanding online international forum on access to justice with the University of California, Irvine. And we're planning part two of that relationship in LA in October. If you happen to be on the west coast of the US, please come and join us. We'll send out lots more information in between. And some of you may have heard of this little thing we're doing called Pulse, the Public Understanding of Law Survey. It is world first research looking at what legal problems people have, what they think about legal services and institutions, and how they navigate our justice systems. And I am happy to say that after COVID delays, we now have nearly 6,000 face-to-face interviews, which was our aim. And we will begin data analysis soon. As you can imagine, we were uh, set back in our, <laughs> in our time frames in terms of getting to 6,000 Victorians. But that is, uh, that is within touching distance now. And Pulse, when it's delivered, will powerfully inform policy and practice. It will be relevant to all of you. Knowing what civil problems which people are facing, what they're doing about them, where they are, and their ability to respond is incredibly useful. And we trust that you will take advantage of this re remarkable data set when the time comes. We will be reporting the findings of PASS throughout 2023, and you can sign up for updates on the website. Please go and we'll, you know, we'll make sure that you know what's happening next. And the other critical thing that I always take the opportunity to mention on this occasion is Law Week. It is upon us very soon. It starts on the 15th of May. It will be here in a flash. And I'm delighted to tell you that the Law Week website for 2023 is now up, and you can lodge your events anytime between now and March 17. You'll remember it because it's St. Patrick's Day. So you need your event in before St. Patrick's Day, please. And one of the great events that we have each year in Law Week is the Law Talks event for high school students. And I'm so thrilled that this year we're taking it to Gippsland, back in person for the first time in three years. As always, we continue our roster of training for the profession, public events on legal, interest, uh, legal matters of, of public interest, and grant making as well, which continues unabated. Community legal grants are now open. If you're interested, please check out the website and we look forward very much to your participation in all those events and more over the year. There's a lot going on, and if you'd like any info, get in touch with me, you know, wave me down, send me an email, or check out the website, and please don't hesitate to get in touch, because we love to hear from you. Finally, before we wrap, and I think there's still a little bit of banana bread left if you need some sugar to go, my very sincere thanks to everyone involved in making today a success. Can I just thank the weather gods? It did rain at about 6am this morning, and I did hold my breath, but... 
Thank you. We, we have managed to get through another LLB without umbrellas. To our speakers, the attorney, Fiona McClay, Justice Forbes and Jacob Varghese, to Shante Cherie for an absolutely stunning acknowledgement of country. As I said to her, it hits you in the solar plexus. It really does. And I think that was a very special moment this morning. And to our VLF staff who pull this off year in, year out, particularly to Kate and Nikita and Jackie and Leon, who've done an extraordinary amount of work to pull this all together. To our great volunteers from Victorian Women's Lawyers, from Australian Women Lawyers, from Vic Barr, from the Legal Services Board, the Law Institute and the College of Law. Also to Danielle and Tristan from Atticus Media, who are responsible for our fabulous live stream. Good morning to everybody who's watching online. And the lovely local traders that we have in Hardware Lane who turn out the breakfast, particularly Helena at Corner and Bench and Max's who have provided power this morning without which we, we would be stuffed, frankly. So thank you to Michael at Max's. And also to Gabrielle Curley, our Auslan interpreter who has um, been, I think, a Trojan <laughs> performer this morning. It's really difficult to keep this up for an extended period of time. It has been a joy as always to see your happy smiling faces. I wish you every success in 2023 and hope to see you at many and varied events throughout the year. Go well and thanks for being with us. <laughs>